Right, we're ready then. We're ready. Hello, viewers. Uh, this is a video I wanted to do to chat to my friend, Matthew Goodison, who's here on Zoom. So this is a Zoom recording thing. Uh, so if the quality is not amazing, we blame Zoom, not ourselves. Um, I thought we could just talk about creativity. I thought it would just be like some kind of chat, but Matthew tells me that I'm in charge. And uh, so I'm saying hello. So I'm David Gauntler. I'm uh, a Canada Research Chair at Ryerson University. I run a thing called the Creativity Everything Lab that I set up. I've been in Canada for about two years. Before that, um, I worked with Matt Goodison at the University of Westminster, which was amazing because he was great. <laughs> uh, Matt, tell them something about you. So yes, I am a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster. I am now a course leader of the music course there. Uh, prior to my time working at uh, at Westminster, I was a touring musician in a rock, electronic rock and roll band called The Infidels. And that was a wild and crazy ride. I would say that all the cliches are true of my experience of 10 years on the road. It was uh, a brilliant experience and also a very psychologically difficult experience. So yeah, I set out after that experience of um, doing a lot of professional shows, played all over the world, Coachella and Glastonbury and everywhere, which was great. Worked as a songwriter for Sony, ATV, and then in my kind of early 30s, had a bit of a breakdown and decided that I wanted to help other people in education have the same um, experience their dreams, to fulfill their dreams and to overcome some of the barriers that I'd had to my education and learning. And that's where creativity came in. So discovered Ken Robinson, was blown away by his ideas, decided to do a master's. Then I wrote and did some creativity research, got a job at Westminster and met, to my delight, Professor David Gauntlet, who also shared the same enthusiasm for creativity. Yes, nice, thank you. Uh, so we've got to be reasonably concise because nobody wants to watch us bang on for too long, or do they? We already worked out that it's only going to be like four people who know who we are who are going to watch this, but there we go. Um, I wrote down a few things um, that we could talk about on a list, a bullet point list. So we'll go through them. Um, my first thing was just, what have you been doing lately? Obviously, COVID-19 has been happening. I just thought this is a little bit where you could tell us about a couple of creative things you've done lately, and I can do the same. I'm going to answer all my own questions as well. <laughs> I love it. You go first. I can just, I can just watch you talking about. That's what they are. I could just watch you interview yourself, David. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fake of you, because then you haven't got anybody else messing it up. That's what, that's what I'm going to say about collaboration, which is point two. <laughs> so I think COVID-19 has um, offered an interesting lens for us to look at lots of things. Yeah. I will say that I think there's an aspect of it that's deeply tragic for anyone that's going through or gone through loss. Um, I've lost a few close people to coronavirus that has been um, deeply emotional and very difficult to deal with. So yeah, my, my heart really goes out to anyone that's, that's on the front line of this um, global pandemic. However, equally, it's changed all of our lives radically. And if you're anything like me and probably David, you think about stuff quite a lot. And I think certain questions have come up as a result of coronavirus. And certainly, I think part of me wishes that coronavirus was a digital virus that had taken down the internet. Because I then think that would offer such a different approach to how we're going to live in the 21st century, rather than a physical virus that has essentially driven more online um, interaction than ever before. So being in music, coronavirus has really changed quite a lot because we have the live experience and that has really been taken apart by coronavirus some of my friends run live booking agencies and all shows have been cancelled so i think we're seeing a rise in thinking about what the live experience could look like we already had dj marshmallow 
performing in Fortnite, which I'm pretty sure David wasn't involved in, and neither was I, because we're of a certain generation where you sit in a seat in a venue to watch a, a gig. <laughs> um, but that, I think, was the beginning of people starting to think about the live experience differently. And now I think we're going to see a radical change in what that looks like maybe VR technology, certainly online concerts and things like that. So it's been very interesting to see what we return to when, um, when coronavirus eases, if coronavirus eases. I think for me, I decided to make a record. As an artist, I think of being an artist as almost taking Polaroids of your life through different stages. I feel like I've taken quite a substantial amount of Polaroids as me, the rock and roller, in my time in the Infidels. And... This offered an interesting opportunity to take a Polaroid of my life in lockdown with my kids in the studio and having no physical interaction with anyone else or any other musicians. So files were sent and transferred. So I've made, almost finished making an album, an EP is out already called Wavescape. That is a collaboration with an artist, Catherine Greenwood. And lots of the files have been transferred digitally. And I think what's become fascinating about it, the record was for a art exhibition um, called Into the... Yeah, my brain's gone. <laughs> wasn't called Into the Wild. It's the for the Wilderness Art Collective. And it was all about nature and art. So to have that experience moved online was quite interesting at, at the beginning of lockdown. And the, the record is really... It's been shaped by COVID and how those interactions have all been online, the interactions with Catherine and the other musicians. So essentially I made a record using machines, uh, all these wonderful uh, modular synths behind me, and I scored the output of the machines and then sent the scores to violinists, flautists, flautists clarinet players, and they sent back their interpretations of that. So my kind of comment was really, about where are we as people where is where are we as a race now if you're going wow. to draw a big picture that's, that's uh, about it so that's what i've been doing as well as thinking about delivering education and and creativity in an online format so that's where i've been where have you been and what have you been up to in the in i'm COVID? going to ask one question about that before we do um even though you got into lots of detail quite quick but that i think there you hinted it the thing which i think is this your unique is this your thing uniquely where you get modular synths making all kinds of sounds and i i think i know from how you work you you basically muck about and and random things kind of happen they're created they're curated created or curated by you but it's, it's there's a certain serendipity element at least so there's all sorts of weird wonderful noises come out basically but then as you mentioned there you then turn that into a score to be played by instrument a conventional instrument people mm -hmm. and you've got the level where you said that then they interpret it so it's you know they're not machines so it comes out in a particular way because of what they've done with it so you've gone through all these different layers of starting with machines then going to human it goes to human via you then it goes to human via the actual actual other humans that perform it and then it comes back and and has an an, an interaction with the person listening as well so that's another human so what a weird thing you've done there that's funny <laughs> is that is that your invention the idea of uh, turning the output of your modular synths into a thing that you then score. Has, are you the first person to do that? I would love to say I am, but I, I came up with it as an idea for myself. Yeah. So in terms of uh, what Margaret Bowden would call little c creativity, I came Literally. up with that idea in my mind, yes. but I equally have subsequently met quite a lot of other people online who have also came up with the same idea in their minds. Damn them. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely find a way to do them for plagiarism anyway <laughs> by by inventing a fake time stream where you actually invented it in 1749 um well anyway that sounds really cool i did want to ask you about collaboration because you've got that collaboration with Catherine greenwood we'll do that in a sec you said what have i been doing i've been um and you know how the pandemic unfolded in that way where you just you sort of don't realize it's happening at first and it's like oh we're gonna have to like stay in for two weeks and then a bit more time goes by and you're like it's not gonna be two weeks <laughs> and so on and then after a month you're like oh, it's not just the one month then and so on um, and where so, are we now david 
but quite early on in it, I, I managed to get really frustrated that I wasn't going to get any chance to get my book done um, because I got used to doing it a certain way, whereas mostly writing it in cafes, and that wasn't happening. Uh, then I started just getting up before everybody else in the household to do it and, and made a good start there. Anyway, it's boring about my scheduling, but basically I have found opportunities to write my book. Um, and that, I've done another like, it, it went from being like 15,000 words to 38,000 words in the past four months. So that's nice. Um, I, don't, I obviously have to find things to write about and not just put down any words. You can't just put down words from the dictionary, for example, it doesn't work. Um, so I've had to put some words into the correct order. Uh, I'm quite pleased with that. And also at the same time, I've been doing music more. Um, and I basically managed to produce one track that I was pleased with, that I'm willing to share, which I was never willing to share anything before, which is where basically I've got a lot going on and I'm just trying to make it as exciting as possible. Uh, and then I did another one where I think I always start off with some kind of minimalist ideal, but then it goes wrong because I think, oh, this is boring and I need to show that I can do things. So, uh, so you throw everything in. So I tried to be more minimal on my second one, but I still ended up like just adding bits and bobs to make it more interesting because otherwise you think, well, that's a bit boring. Which is the topic of minimalism, which was meant to be, that's topic three. So sorry, <laughs> that, well, that'll be, uh, we'll run out of time really soon, so we better not do that. I'm going to ask you about collaboration. So your collaboration, this sounds like a collaboration to be manageable to me because you're not both doing the same thing. You're doing music uh, and Catherine Greenwood, who you're doing this collaboration with, she's not doing music at all. Has she had any no. input on your music? She's producing art, which inspires you or something. Tell us how it works, Matt. Go. So we, we met as local artists um, and I was very interested in this idea of, working locally I think it's very easy to get into your sort of world head on the internet and think oh we could collaborate with all these people but I thought it'd be fascinating to do a local based project and so I've been meeting local artists and we both we both shared two things firstly it was a deep connection with Ashdown Forest which is the forest that's between our two houses and the two villages and as an electronic musician, I had a, a really difficult time adjusting to being an electronic musician in a city. And that felt like a very easy relationship, industrial noises and machines and electronics all felt like a good fit. And suddenly I was this electronic composer in the middle of a forest, looking out onto trees and, and sheep. And I thought, well, how does electronic music relate to this forest and I kept trying to, to make my kind of thundering electronic music from the city and it just wasn't working it wasn't resonating with my new environment and I drew inspiration from the forest and realized something very simple that electricity is also a natural phenomenon <laughs> easy to forget that electricity is also a natural occurring thing and that unlocked this connection um, that's mm. talked about in a new book called The Lark Ascending about essentially raving in forests and this tradition between outside a kind of life celebration, electronic music and all these things unpacked as well as the patterns that occur in nature and this notion of constant repetition yet always change. So for example, if you look at a river, it's always the same river the patterns are always different. So I really drew on these inspirations and then inevitably that led to minimalism, which is topic three, which is a form of music that represents something that's constantly the same and something that's always different. So to cut a long story short, even though it has been quite long, Catherine shared similar inspirations with nature. And we both realized that we, we often work with quite outdated technologies so for me, modular synths, um, I've got tape machines and she does etchings. And we both became quite fascinated by what I call the dust. So the, the bit that the technology adds to the work. So if it's a VHS, it's the fuzzy lines. And if it's a cassette tape, it's that slight seasick warble and tape hiss. If it's an etching, you get these additional artifacts that that join in and without going there but you could argue that some form of computer art I don't 
but I think that's really interesting. And I think that's what then led to my work being about these transferal processes. So you impart something into technology, technology adds a bit. And then what I think is so interesting is when the human aspect is then mirroring the technologically added addition, the, the thing that the computer has added or the, the medium has added being mirrored by a person. So we, we really shared that and thought it'd be great to collaborate where Catherine does some work and I've recorded some of her machines, put them in to the music. I do some work. She then recreates art based on the music. And we, 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 we enter this, the same feedback loop that the, the work inspires from us as well. And yes, again, to summarize, it has been very successful because Catherine does art, I do sound. And it's been really nice to work in those two forms. But the initial idea for the exhibition was to have an immersive piece. And what I wanted to do was use some form of theremin technology. So as people walk around the physical exhibition, the distance to the theremin would determine the changes in the sound. So we think of the theremin as something that goes, <laughs> but in fact, that's just data being transmitted from the aerial and you can use that data transmission to change the melody or it doesn't have to be, you know, a Telstar record. So that was the original okay. idea, but obviously that was disrupted by COVID. Oh yeah. I was going to say, are you still doing that then or what? But you not at the moment of... because we can't, yeah. Yes. No one can go anywhere. So it became, oh, it, became an EP. Yeah. it became an EP um, and it also became a Wavescape memory box, which is a tiled nine squared web page where the audience can compose their own score by playing different videos and all the music overlaps and they can fade it in and out. Because I also love these ideas of unfinished and the audience person, the audience finishing the thing. I, I'm uh -huh. fascinated by, by those ideas rather than the composer going, this is how it's supposed to be. You will listen to it like this. Yeah. Um, so I've, I bought what well, I thought I bought the Wavescapes album, but if I merely bought the Wavescapes EP is the more of that. Um, I bought it on Bandcamp for actual money. But I know you were you were giving the money to the NAACP, uh, and but it it's beautiful though, and I'm not just saying that because I know you because obviously if I knew you and you'd done something that was like quite nice or whatever you'd sort of be like yeah good I'm glad he's done that you wouldn't actually listen to it <laughs> but I have actually been listening to your actual music and it's very beautiful, um, and I I was. I don't want to say I was surprised, but it was different to what I was expecting. I don't know. It was, it, it, you've done very well. <laughs> it, it, I think it, what I loved about your comment. It's different to other things. You said, previous things. yeah, it's very, very different for me. And what I liked as well, you said about it, you said, I expected it as it, when it started to all be the same. And actually it's really different as it goes through, it goes through a whole myriad of, of, different pieces and the reason for that is they were all the pieces were composed separately and wow. then the the ep is essentially two performances of a improvised piece is it but it's got so much going on it doesn't feel like a thing that you've like played live or could play live really sort of thing because it's got so many different sorts of parts i mean obviously people can do that live <laughs> otherwise you could never have live music but um oh, I, I kind of assumed it had been highly worked over in the studio and assembled in that way rather than being like a, perfor a performance well it, it had been a, a loop of composition and performance going round until oh. until it felt in a position where it, it could feel like that. So the individual components were composed and recomposed and put into what I felt was the big picture to see how they sat within that and then taken back out again and worked and put back in. Right. So it, it was a very lengthy compositional process. 
but then the final performance was a moment in time. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. Well, it works. <laughs> and <laughs> so there will be an album coming. So that was that's going to be side B of the LP. Okay. And now I'm finishing another side A because I wanted to press it on vinyl, but I thought for those people that already have it, there should always be something more with a vinyl. Yes. I'm like, why you want me to buy it again? Oh, <laughs> typical move. It's like releasing your movie and then releasing the sp special edition of your movie six months later. Um, it's not, it's not that scam. It's beautiful, everybody. You should definitely get it. Maybe I should call the album something else. Maybe, maybe the album's a new piece. I don't know. I, I don't mind. It was very nice. Um, <laughs> so on collaboration, was there anything else I wanted to ask you about that? What was the most difficult bit of collaborating with a person who's not you to arrive at this thing? I think what's interesting about collaboration, being a musician, I've come from a very collaborative background. Mm. Prior to the widespread use of the computer, it was very difficult to make a piece of music that someone else could listen to without collaborating. So mm. I learned the guitar and inevitably, I mean, I could have made solo guitar music, but Inevitably, I worked with singers and drummers and bass players and clarinet players, trumpet players, all kinds of different musicians, as well as tape recording engineers, producers, a whole host of collaborative people. So for me, collaboration is a very natural part of creativity. And as the computer has dominated musical creativity in the 21st century, a lot of those aspects have disappeared. And it's been fascinating to see them reappear in new ways. For me, one of the most fascinating of those is a new um, app and piece of software called Endless that is developed by Tim Exile. And it's a fascinating new way of making music, which is essentially a constant improvisation where the world is collaborating with each other on compositions and tracks. So that's really cool. I'm so into that. But going back to the, to the question, was it difficult to collaborate with someone who wasn't me? I think collaboration is always brings challenges and challenges of communication as well as challenges of ego what you think is utterly brilliant, someone may really not like, and what they think is brilliant, you really might not like. And what I found fascinating working with Catherine was the level of, that something was worked to, worked up, did not necessarily correlate to the love of the work from the other person. So oh. sometimes a finished piece of mine was less inspiring for Catherine than the kind of initial idea uh. and sometimes some of her very quick sketches marks on paper like one line I found tremendously inspiring and I think that's always surprising in because I can't imagine that like you write books I can't imagine me preferring your first draft of a book to the final yeah. form and I think with with art forms there's an interesting line with unfinished and finished where is finished and where is the beauty yeah there's something about the freshness of a thing that you've just done out of excitement and passion and it's the first thing you've thought of compared to something that's been i mean things can definitely get too much worked over can't they like you you over polish and it's not so good yeah. um like with with book writing i i tend to try to get it sort of quite you know good and vibrant at first and then I don't go over it to make it less good <laughs> anyway out of sheer laziness um uh but yeah I know what you mean I could I can really picture that for like some if like if you just got some exciting music idea and you just kind of do your best to do it in, and, and, and we just hear it at that point or somebody just starting to do some artistic thing you can see how that's got an excitement which you know maybe actually fades as, as time goes on and you just do more things and you get more familiar with it so you think that it needs to be enlivened by adding more things but actually it doesn't need to be enlivened by adding more things you just got used to what was already there but what was already there was actually good but you've got used to it so it's so you then spoil it for yourself it's like yeah. you said about you set out to make quite a minimalist piece and ended up making a maximal piece yeah that's quite common yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's 
I think the thing for me, oh yeah, let's just talk about it. This is the only thing I want to talk about in the minimalism topic then, I think. It's just, um, I think it's to do with being relatively inexperienced in a thing, probably. Because um, like you're so experienced at making music and you presumably know that you're good because you've put in so many hours at doing it that um, I guess you've got nothing to prove as such. So you could do a piece which sort of doesn't have much in it and you're not worried about like I have the kind of worries where I just sort of think that people are going to think I'm incompetent <laughs> and that I was only able to produce like one sound or, or one sound that didn't do very much. And you just well, think, oh, good at his music because he, he couldn't make it do anything. One um, of the pieces on Wavescapes was a recording of the birds in the forest. I then took the recording and used a MIDI, audio MIDI converter, converted the audio to MIDI and applied a piano. Bounce. So there was none of my musicality in there at all. And what you're left with is an incredibly fractured random piano. Uh, so yeah, I think I probably agree. I, I feel like I have nothing to prove musically uh, to anyone. And I'm afraid to give due respects to the bird artists in question. We have to point out it's not random. They work very hard on their tunes. Uh, isn't that right? The, the, bird, the bird aspect is turned into MIDI. So it is not random. I would say the random aspect is all of the birds doing their thing all at the same time. Okay. So it wasn't just one bird. It was a right. forest of birds. Okay, an orchestra. But that's not random either because they are listening to each other, I, I guess, waiting that for a space is. to do their thing in. Exactly. Respect where it is due. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually nice though. Yeah, why? Yeah. I'd love to have the confidence to have something where I'm not trying to put too much in. I'm getting towards that, but this isn't about me anyway. Um, another, oh, here's another thing that is about me though. Uh, um, and given the amount of time we've got, this might be our final topic. But a thing that plague, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say about this. Um, a thing that troubles me with doing music is because like, I've been doing, like, sort of trying to make music on and off, as I put it, um, for about five years now, but it's been really on and off and mostly off. And when we moved to Canada, I didn't do it for like uh, a year and a half or something just because everything else was so discombobulating. And then I got back into it and, I'm, and now I'm more into it. But the number of hours that I've actually spent doing it um, might be like 200 or something, which I think is a big number, you know, 200 hours. God, that's a lot of time. But then there's this idea of 10,000 hours that people are meant to have put in in order to have creative mastery, which is a kind of well-known thing I think amongst creative people and Malcolm Gladwell wrote about it in the book Outliers which made it much more popular and it's based on research which, which is often about things like chess players who've become grandmasters um, or tennis players who've become world champions that kind of thing which is different to creativity um, but anyway so then I, th I sort of think anything I do in the next few years like if I if I put in the same amount of effort over the next five years then I've done 400 hours which to me sounds like quite a lot of hours, but compared to 10,000 hours, you're just nowhere. And you're just like, you know, it's, it's, it's hopeless. And, um, and I sometimes do little sums where it's like, well, if I do, you know, if I manage to do like three hours a week, which seems like quite a lot with the commitments of work and kids and everything else and trying to live a life. Um, well then I can get up to 10,000 hours, but I'll be 156. And I'm not sure I can wait that long. <laughs> so the question is, uh, what, what thoughts do you have about that? that whole thing and like there's different things I, i'll just tell you a few more things i think like one thing i think is well it depends what you count doesn't it because it's like if you count anything you've ever done that's to do with music in your life which includes like listening to and thinking about music reading interviews with musicians which i've done in you know music magazines since i was a teen and and all and all those different things and like i did actually used to play the clarinet at school and things like all of that feeds into your lifelong learning about this kind of thing i guess so then you can actually make it so it's like you've done 10,000 hours, but it feels like I'm cheating because like, this not, doesn't include the bit where you're sitting down doing it. It's just all the other stuff. <gasps> it's a pain. There's also the thing about like, do I want to be the equivalent of a chess grandmaster in music? No, not really. That wasn't really the point. And the point was to be, you know, the interest in just doing it and deliberately doing something that I'm not that good at, at least not at first, you know, something that is hard um, and uncomfortable and which I'm embarrassed to show to people. I was deliberately doing it for that reason. And, and I, I still like doing it, but this 10,000 hours things uh, sits in my mind and, and, and taunts me sort of basically going, you're an amateur, you're nothing. You're just a middle-aged man mucking about with some electronic music. There's loads of them on SoundCloud and they're all shit. <laughs> um, 
what should I do with these thoughts, Matthew? They are interesting thoughts, aren't they? And I think they're thoughts that plague adults, not necessarily children. Good point, yeah. And I came to this understanding I think a lot of people reach. I uncovered it a little bit in the small amount of research I've done into creativity, which discusses the difference between the amount of time you spend playing, mucking about, coming up with stuff, and the amount of time you spend perfecting and honing things. And I think as we get older, we get much, much better at the refining process of taking something and finishing it, making it better and better and better, sometimes making it worse. And I, what I think we lose is the confidence to fail because that doesn't fit with our education system. It doesn't fit with our model of capitalism that we live in. It doesn't fit with our measurements of success, with how people say, oh, David's really good at this, but don't listen to him talk about this or don't ever listen to his music. And um, I think all of these things play into our psychology as adults and quite often prevent us from undertaking new things. Maybe you've always wanted to play golf. I always wanted to play tennis and I'm really bad at it. Really <laughs> bad. But I love it. So the question then is, what do I do with that? I'm never going to be a tennis pro because I'm already too old. 41, I'm done. I'm over. Roger Federer is really old for a tennis player. And what's he, 35 or something? 36? I don't know. But anyway, all I hear is Roger Federer is really old for a tennis player. He looks young to me, you know? So they're interesting questions. But what is most fascinating about this question, in my experience as a touring musician that was on the world stage, effectively playing in the premiership was the question never went away there was always a level up you were, I was playing with the chemical brothers and the prodigy and the foo fighters and the white stripes and metallica and then you've got you know all the dead superstars the beatles I thought they're all dead but the beatles and you know you've got these hierarchical levels of success that felt to me, no matter how high up that you went that ladder, you never reached it. There was always more layers above. So then that becomes a very interesting question. And the answer to your 10,000 hour rule is, if you came to me and said, I want to earn my living, I want to earn all of my money from music, what do I need to do? And that's one 10,000 hour, 10, hours. But another question could be, I want to make music and find flow in the process and I would say that's a very different 10,000 hours because that could just involve a whole different set of things that you do and ultimately to achieve flow to achieve that wonderful state of it's like creative calmness is the wrong word it's, it's like the most connected you can feel as a human on the planet to me finding your thing whatever it is in yoga tennis music just where you're it feels like your brain is working at its utmost capacity by not really doing anything at all then that is about a practice a creative practice and removing any barriers to that psychological state which could be what button does that again or are oh, the computers stop doing that any of those have to be overcome for you to find flow and then it's about finding your practice. I found mine with, with our Compose using random and chance operations on the modular. I then convert that to a score. I then get players to play the score. And that is my flow. I'm very comfortable with that process. So it's about, I think, for you, just doing it enough to you find your flow, find your process that gives you the happiness that you are looking for from the discipline. Yeah. Is that a good answer? It's a lovely answer. I suppose uh, you're you're touching on the ways in which, um, or you're reminding me of the ways in which, basically, uh, there's just all these different reasons why you do things, and it pulls you in different directions. And sort of as you said, you've mentioned capitalism, I think, and the sort of demand for success and that kind of thing. I think that does sort of feed into it, like in the sense that, like 
the reason I do it is just because I like doing it. And I like what I'm kind of learning about the creative process through doing it, which I think pays off in, in other things in things I'm writing and so on. So that, that's, that's its value. And I really like that value. Um, and I am happy with that. But then at the same time, there's this thing that you sort of want to put it out there. You want other people to hear it. If you're feeling quite pleased with it yourself, you would like get some other people to hear it. But then that then leads you into this whole world of like exposing it to others and then being, and then you get to the point when you've made it so you are going to be compared to others and, and your music is sort of necessarily more interesting or less interesting than other people's music to other people. Um, and so suddenly at that point, you get thrown onto that kind of hierarchy you're talking about. And like in the case of me, I'm then right at the bottom and obviously at the bottom and I don't expect, I know I'm at the bottom and I, I don't, I sort of, I don't think it would be reasonable to be expect to be further up. <laughs> But at the same time, then it becomes galling because it's like, oh no, you know, I'm I'm the worst at this now. <laughs> Once you put it out there, which is interesting because I like the idea of putting things out there and putting out work in progress and the the Austin Cleon show your work idea where you sort of constantly exhibit your process so that other people can see it just because you know they might be interested. They don't have to be interested if, if they, you know some people are going to be interested and that's nice and it's a good way to connect with people and to to share your creative process and get some engagement and feedback on that. That all seems good. Um, so I suppose it, it just uh, there's just that external thing that suddenly at some point gets attached where it's like now you need to convey yourself to everybody else and how are you doing in the rankings and and inevitably I'm at the bottom of the rankings um yeah but only on a only on a it's only on a measurement that measures mm. engagement and and art is not a sport so there is no winner yeah it, it's that thing, isn't it? It's, it's very double-edged because I do think people should share their creative process. I love it when people share their creative process online, but it is in the act of putting it online that then you do sort of get put onto a scoreboard because then I do look at my, you know, view counts on YouTube if I put the music on YouTube or whatever, and I want those numbers to get bigger. <laughs> um, and at the same time, I know that's kind of silly and that's not why I was doing it in the first place. So it's kind of, it's just screwed up. I'm not saying there's any... Uh, rhyme or reason to what I'm saying. I'm just reflecting on what I hope is a slightly more universal than just me bit of screwed upiness where on the one hand, you love the process. And on the other hand, then once it's out there, you start to worry about sort of how, how you're doing and being judged and that kind of thing, which is hard. So I'm afraid sharing those thoughts isn't necessarily, it doesn't contain any straightforward message, but it might be slightly comforting to other people in the same situation, which I think is probably lots of people because I do this thing on Fridays at the minute. Um, a, a Zoom thing at 11 o'clock Toronto time, which is four o'clock UK time um, uh, on the Artscape Zoom Artscape platform. Artscape's a thing in Toronto. They exist to cultivate creativity in an actual physical space, but they can't do that now, but you know why. Um, so we do it on Zoom instead. And I do what I do like about that is um, all the nice stuff that comes from that is not me telling people how to be creative or giving you my top tips or whatever, because I do a little bit of that at the start, but the real learning and engagement comes when people just share their stories of what they've tried to do and often it's quite screwed up kind of thoughts about well i was trying to do this but then i became worried about this when it went out into the world or sort of comparing yourself with things where you don't even want to be comparing yourself with that but you do it anyway all that mm. kind of stuff because our brains are messy aren't they they are messy and <laughs> putting things out on the internet is daunting quite frightening and sometimes does cultivate those thoughts of inadequacy but ultimately metrics measure things and you have a set of strong metrics in some areas and they're weaker in others i have a different set of metrics that are strong in some areas and weaker in others so you've got loads more twitter followers than i have i've got loads of spotify plays that's right so ultimately they really reflect i think where we've directed most of our attention yeah, it's where your 10,000 hours has gone. Uh. <laughs> you would like more Spotify plays or YouTube plays, and I would like more Twitter followers. But, <laughs> so, no, but the 10,000 hours thing, you can't have everything. Yes. What we have found is that creativity is messy. That's fine. I, I'm full of advice about how you should be at one with the different things and, and feeling the fear and doing it anyway and all of that. And at the same time, which I do think is great advice. And at the same time, I'm plagued by, I'm plagued by the same doubts and fears as everybody else. So that's okay. Isn't it? It's well, fine. I launched, uh, today I launched my podcast, Play in the System. And yeah. I've been the same. I've been a real advocate of 
everyone should podcast, everyone should blog, everyone should make music, feel the fear and do it anyway. So I've launched my podcast and got a terrifying experience launching a podcast because you're, there is no real script. So your innermost thoughts and feelings about the world come through because you're not protected from anything. And in the podcast, there's quite a few controversial subjects about branding and race and identity and some difficult and complex topics. And I thought, should, should I not go there? Should I edit them, edit them out? I have that power. And then I thought, well, editing them out is then surely giving rise to the voice of why they need to be talked about anyway. So I shouldn't shy away from it. But ultimately, I think what I'm trying to say is that launching a podcast, and like you're saying with, with music, I felt so much more nervous and exposed than I thought I would. And it's been quite, uh, I've been quite worried about it, I suppose. Hmm. But I did feel the fear and do it anyway. So it's done yeah. and we'll see how it goes. But you're good at the talking. I thought you knew you were good at the talking. I think it's I think it's complex issues where inevitably with a podcast, what I think is fascinating when you have guests that talk about stuff and you're learning as well. So when you are out of your depth about things, it can be quite worrying because you're exposing the fact that you don't know a great deal about you're talking about an artist you've never heard of them before. <laughs> so you're exposing the fact that I don't know anything about this. And that plays into our, our you know, low metrics, our adult fear of uh, exposure, you know, our fear of um, imposter syndrome, all of those things come up. Yeah. Um, but you're holding yourself to a standard that nobody else would really be holding you to, do they? You, you just need to be the kind of relatable host who can talk about creativity. People don't actually expect you to know about all of the things already that somebody else is talking about, do they? You know, you know that, really, in your heart of hearts. Also, on podcasts, nobody can see how badly you're doing because there's no, like, really big view count number. So, uh, you know, so you can still act like you're doing mega well. <laughs> that, that Spotify under a thousand plays symbol doesn't look that great, does it? Uh uh-huh. But yeah, but you can just imagine that's because everybody's listened to it on Apple Podcasts instead. Exactly. That's where they all are. And then yeah. on Apple Podcasts, you're like, oh, no, they all get it on the Android one. That's what it is. <laughs> it's got a very Android audience. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, don't we have to stop now? We have to stop. Um, okay, I thought we did. It's a shame, um, I've really enjoyed it as always. Thanks for having okay. me on your show. It's not a show. What is it? I don't know. It could be, we could, this could become a show. Who knows? On, on but, your tube? Yes. I'll hopefully uh, see you again on my tube. I'll, I'll be very happy to be on your tube. And I'm very grateful to you for coming on this because there was uh, many memorably interesting things in this that I, I've not thought about before. Like that thing about, that whole thing about electronic music and nature and, and like electricity being part of nature anyway already. Like, oh, because we normally think of it as part of your urban technological city kind of world not part of your nature world that was very good i love that it's interesting isn't it yeah yeah um but we're not going back to that now I'm just i'm, I'm reminiscing yeah. about the conversation yeah. that we've had already it's like i remember a conversation yeah. i had it was great okay um thank you for joining us have a great day it's, it's the start of the day here in toronto and it's towards the end of the day there but you're going to go out to, into a forest with your kids soon probably aren't i'm you? going so, into the forest with my kids right now yeah i'm going into the forest with my kids so isn't that nice? Cool. It was great to have you here. It's as far as I had you. Thank you did. <laughs> have a great rest of the day. Yes. I'll speak to have you a soon. Great day. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye Thanks for watching. <laughs>